So, two Muslim gunmen under the direction of Al-Qaeda stormed the Paris headquarters of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo for mocking Muhammad. Since there's apparently nothing jihadists can possibly do to show that they are, in fact, doing exactly what their religion commands, their shouts of Allahu Akbar and we have avenged the Prophet Muhammad fell on the willfully deaf ears of our Rip Van Winkle world. The response of politicians and the media, as usual, was to rush to the defense of the ideology that led to the attack. According to former chairman of the Democratic National Committee and presidential hopeful Howard Dean, jihadists who obey Muhammad's clear commands to slaughter critics of Islam shouldn't even be called Muslims. Uh, I, I stopped calling these people Muslim terrorists. They're about as Muslim as I am. Never to be outdone in groveling, French President Francois Hollande declared that jihadists who obey Muhammad's orders to the letter have nothing in common with the Muslim faith. Those who have committed those acts, those fanatics, have nothing in common with the rest of the Muslim faith. Rolling down the tracks of the Takiya train, Muslim organizations like CARE wasted no time pulling the Islamophobia card from the bottom of the desperation deck. Mainstream followers of all faiths need to get together and marginalize the, the Muslims, marginalizing the extremists on their side, and also uh, people of other faiths marginalizing this growing Islamophobic movement in the West and now in Europe. Yes, nothing says we support free speech like putting peaceful critics of Islamic terrorism into the same category with terrorists who murder cartoonists. Way to show how moderate you are, care. Now, notice the parallel agendas here. Terrorists kill to silence critics of Islam. Politicians and the media deny reality to silence critics of Islam. Muslim groups in the West demonize anyone who disagrees with them to silence critics of Islam. The methods differ, but the goal is the same. When it comes to free people openly challenging jihad and sharia, peaceful Muslims, violent Muslims, and non-Muslims who suffer from vanishing backbone syndrome are perfectly willing to lay aside their differences, pool their resources, and work together to create a world completely free of any open, honest discussion of Islam. Care buys the muzzles, and terrorists hold us down while politicians and the media strap them onto our faces. The future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. In times like this, it's refreshing to have a friend like Charlie Hebdo, who, while deliberately mocking people's most cherished beliefs, at least doesn't go the way of all the sniveling cowards who mock everything but Islam, thereby enforcing one of the most revolting elements of Sharia. It's too bad Charlie is dead. Le bu, le bu, it is a, it is le ghost of Charlie Hebdo. Now, Charlie, if anyone else had died, I would view this as wildly inappropriate, but seeing as how you're a magazine and given your history of extreme irreverence, I can't help but think that sackcloth and ashes would be out of place. Oui, oui, do not mourn for moi. Instead, honor my memory by sharing the new cartoon of Muhammad. Charlie, my videos revolve around arguments and evidence rather than mere mockery. Far be it from me to promote a cartoon of Muhammad. In fact, I'm going to take this cartoon away from you before we end up hurting someone's feelings. And besides, since you're a ghost now, Muslims might call gin busters on you. Oh, and you thought he was kidding about Le Jean Busters. Now, what should we do about that outrageous comment by Le Traitor Francois Hollande? Well, I'll probably make a separate video going into more detail about Muhammad ordering Muslims to kill critics of Islam, but let's look at a couple of examples for now. Super! Once upon a time, Muhammad told his followers to execute a Muslim named Al-Harith for avenging his father's death. A Jewish man named Abu Afek, who was more than a hundred years old, was upset that Al-Harith was executed, so he did something drastic. He wrote a poem insulting Muhammad. Let's read the poem. Abu Afek wrote, Long have I lived. Again, this guy was more than a hundred years old. But never have I seen an assembly or collection of people more faithful to their undertaking and their allies when called upon, and the sons of Kaila when they assembled, men who overthrew mountains and never submitted 
So he's praising the descendants of Kaila, people who would never submit to outside rule. A writer who came to them, the writer is Muhammad, a writer who came to them split them in two, saying, permitted, forbidden of all sorts of things. Had you believed in glory or kingship, you would have followed Tuba. Tuba was a king from Yemen. When he invaded, the sons of Kaila fought him off. So Abu Afek is saying, you fought off a great king because you never backed down. But Muhammad comes along, causes a bunch of division, and now you're killing each other. You would have been better off following Tuba. And what happens to Monsieur Abu Afek? Let's find out, Charlie. The apostle said, who will deal with this rascal for me? Whereupon Salim ibn Umair went forth and killed him. Abu Afek was sleeping in a courtyard. Salim uh, snuck up and stabbed him through the liver over a poem that offended Muhammad. But killing critics has nothing to do with Islam, right, you silly liberals? Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. When Muhammad took Mecca, he gave his followers a list of people who were to be killed even if they were found hiding beneath the curtains of the Kaaba. Let's read about three of them. Another was Abdullah ibn Qatal. He had become a Muslim, and the apostles sent him to collect the poor tax in company with one of the Ansar. He had with him a freed slave who served him. He was a Muslim. When they halted, he ordered the latter to kill a goat for him and prepare some food and went to sleep. When he woke up, the man had done nothing, so he attacked and killed him and apostatized. He had two singing girls, Fartana and her friend, who used to sing satirical songs about the apostle, so he ordered that they should be killed with him. Think about this, Charlie. Abdullah killed someone and apostatized, so Muhammad ordered his followers to kill him. They found him clinging to the curtains of the Kaaba, and they ripped open his belly. But Muhammad also issued a death sentence for the two singing girls, and all they did was sing satirical songs about him. Satirical? Where have we heard about satire recently? The great thing about Charlie Hebdo is they were in only one business, uh, satire. Their images made them giants of satire. Many on Twitter also saying that they don't necessarily agree with the satire that this magazine uh, often published. The individuals involved with the, the satirical magazine. Out of Paris, an attack at the office of a well-known French satirical magazine. And we note that this was a satirical magazine. So, satire is a capital offense, according to Mohammed. And yet CNN assures us that killing over satire has nothing to do with Islam. Um, I mean, it, it, he was attacked and, you know, defamed many times during his life, and there was not one time where he told people to take retribution for that. Someone should make a satire of these ridiculous liars at CNN, no? Or at least stop watching news networks that won't stop lying to us. Interestingly, Muhammad's followers soon realized that they didn't need to wait for him to order them to kill critics. They could kill people at will for mocking their prophet. Sunan Abu Dawud, 4361. A blind man had a female slave who had borne him a child, who reviled the prophet and disparaged him. And he told her not to do that, but she did not stop. And he rebuked her, but she paid no heed. One night she started to disparage and revile the prophet, so he took a dagger and put it in her stomach and pressed on it and killed her. There fell between her legs a child who was smeared with the blood that was there. The next morning mention of it was made to the prophet, and he assembled the people and said, By Allah, I adjure the man who did this to stand up. The blind man stood up and came through the people, trembling, and he came and sat before the prophet. He said, O messenger of Allah, I am the one who did it. She used to revile you and disparage you, and I told her not to do it, but she did not stop. And I rebuked her, but she paid no heed. I have two sons from her who are like two pearls, and she was good to me. Last night she started to revile you and disparage you, and I took a dagger and placed it on her stomach, and I pressed on it until I killed her. The prophet said, bear witness that no retaliation is due for her blood. So a Muslim killed the mother of his own children for making fun of Muhammad. Muhammad didn't want his followers doing that sort of thing. This would have been a really good time to say it. Instead, Muhammad said there was to be no retaliation against the man for slaughtering the mother of his own children. I believe I met this woman yesterday in the spirit realm. She runs a support group for victims of jihad. We have the honor of being the largest ghost organization in history. There are 270 million of us. And thanks to the tireless efforts of Western news programs and Western governments, your support group for victims of jihad is sure to keep growing, Charlie. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States 
to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. Sunan Abu Daud, 4362. A Jewish woman used to revile and disparage the Prophet. A man strangled her until she died, and the Messenger of Allah declared that no recompense was payable for her blood. So, once again, a woman makes fun of Muhammad. One of Muhammad's followers kills her for it, and Muhammad says that there is to be no retaliation against the man. What do you think of that, President Obama? Islam has a proud tradition of tolerance. Let's put all of this together, Charlene. Did Muhammad command his followers to kill people for making fun of him? Oui, that is quite clear from the sources we read. Did his followers obey his command by killing people who made fun of him? Clearly, Muhammad's followers brutally murdered both men and women for insulting him. So, does killing people for insulting Muhammad have something to do with Islam? Oui, oui. Why then are so many of our leaders and so many reporters telling us the exact opposite? Because they are a bunch of trembling, treacherous, pigeon-hearted cowards hiding in the shadows of their enormous bodyguards while praising the most evil terrorist of all time so that those of us who are being butchered like sheep don't interrupt their golf games by spilling our blood on the designer shoes they wear on their cold feet. I have personally eaten escargot with more backbone than this gelatinous President Hollande. And we all know the real reason gutless President Obama didn't show up to the Unity March is that Sunday is his day for polishing his peace prize. But these viscous, feeble news networks of yours won't say any of this because they are too busy perfecting their spot-on impersonation of a school of gooey jellyfish. These bedwetters are probably too scared to watch this video because it has ghost in the title. Gee, tell us what you really think there, Charlie. One and two and three to the floor. Sally Ebb's door is knocking at your door. Trick or treat, or better yet, do go through the most jokes in the haunted. You make fun of your prophet with a fresh cartoon. Next sketch of Muhammad is coming real soon. Can't stop me if you put me in the hearse. I draw last and fast, and I always draw first. She had us have guns, but I have my pens. Just me, Sally Ebb's door will never end if you bring me back at your next sale. So short to hear me say, Viva la France.